Donc il y en a un pour le poste, Seigneur Galat. Good afternoon. As you can see, as you heard, I'm not Filipino, I'm British. And I was actually born to a poor family in England. But of course, being poor in a country like England is very different to being poor in the Philippines. Because even though my family was poor, I got uh, free education, free health care, everything I could need. And at the age of 20, Prince Charles actually lent me some money, believe it or not, to start a business in computer games. Uh, through his foundation, he lent me about 200,000 pesos. And that computer game company became one of the biggest computer game companies in the whole of Europe. But I remember lying awake one night and I was on my bed and I was thinking, wondering why, even though I had everything I could possibly want, I had a Ferrari, Porsche, BMWs, I used to go to work by helicopter if I didn't want to drive. Even though I had all of this stuff, somehow it started to feel like my life was uh, really empty and it would never be enough, no matter what I bought. And I started to understand that there's a big difference between pleasure and happiness. You back? Pleasure always has a price tag. A new clothes, new car, new vacation. But whereas happiness comes from your relationships, and especially knowing that you're fulfilling God's purpose with your life. And so, when I started to pray, it suddenly hit me that I was successful only because many people in my country helped the poor, of whom I was one. Despite dropping out of high school, people in my country did not give up on me. And they helped me to keep going, and they helped me to start my business, and in the end, I was able to be a good citizen, because people in my country helped the poor. And, uh, you know, I've now been here for seven years, sorry, nine years already. And seeing Gawad Kalinga, I spent six months traveling the world before I got to the Philippines, looking for charities that I could help. And but what I saw when I got here really changed my life. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen, Gawad Kalinga. Places that used to be slums, that were now beautiful, peaceful communities. And uh, my intent was just to make a donation. I offered $100,000 to Tony Melotto. I said, I'm going to sell my car, please use the money to build a village and call it the BMW Village. And he said, uh, I don't want your money, why don't you come back and uh, help us to decide how to use that money. And so, as you heard, my plan was to stay for six weeks, but I fell in love with Gawad Kalina, fell in love with the Philippines, fell in love with his daughter, who was right here. <laughs> and that's what I mean by the Filipino dream. And you know, uh, you think about the American dream, what it is. The dream I was raised with, the American dream, it's the biggest house, the biggest car, the best career. It's all about me. Me, me, me. That's the American dream. But the Filipino dream is never just about me, right? It's always about my family. It's about my community. It's about my school. It's about my friends. And that's what I've learned in the Philippines after nine years. The Filipinos are the most amazing people I've ever met in my life. And I say this in all sincerity, I visited more than 50 countries, and I found you a very special people. You're always singing, you're always laughing, you're always eating. I bet some of you are eating right now. <laughs> but beyond being so joyful, you are the most heroic people I've ever met. How amazing is that? And wherever you go throughout the world, Filipinos, you thrive, you flourish, you blossom. If you go to the USA, Filipinos in America are the second highest earning group. Indians are number one. Filipinos are number two. Caucasians like me, we're number six in America. Because given the right opportunity, given the right uh, environment, you thrive and you, you flourish. I just want to show you a picture of a city that I really love. This is a beautiful, clean city, and I would love to live there. I want to show you this. See if you can guess which city this is. Anyone recognize it? This is Manila. You see Rojas Boulevard on the left? Dewey Boulevard it was called in those days. Look how blue Manila Bay is. Look how clean the Pasig is. This is from the 1960s. Can you believe it? Look how, how these streets are. Every single street swept clean. No garbage anywhere. Every car is brightly polished. Every person looks good. Looks uh, their best. Pride. Pride in this city. This is Manila 50 years ago. And we know that it's not quite that way anymore. We know there are things to fix. But I'm just amazed at how many of you and how many Filipinos are out there fixing them. This is a Gawad Kalinga village in 2004. This is Paseco compound at the mouth of the Pasig River. 
And this is what Filipinos did to it. Here's another one. This could be any slum that you see around the metro. Thousands of places look like this. And this is what we did to it. Can you imagine if every slum in the Philippines becomes a beautiful, peaceful, Gawad Kilinga village? House after house, slum after slum, family after family. This is the Filipino dream being built right before our eyes. And I talk a lot about Gawad Kilinga because it's the thing that changed my life. It's the thing that gave me purpose and meaning. Uh, before I got married to my wife, of course. But, and if you take a piece of gold, you kick it around on the floor for 400 years, it won't look like gold anymore. It will just look like a piece of dirt. And this is what I think has happened in the Philippines. For 400 years you've been kicked around. For 400 years you've been told you're second class in your own country. And it's not surprising there are a few problems. But the gold is still there in the middle. The gold in every single Filipino that inspired me uh, to give my life to Gawad Kilinga and to the Philippines. And so I believe in the Filipino dream. I believe that you have a bright future ahead of you. And you know, my own country, England, used to be much worse than the Philippines. England was a country of slums. The government was very corrupt. And what changed England was not the government. It started when people started really living out their faith, helping the poor. It became fashionable for the rich in England to give away their land and build entire towns for the poor, including the town where I was born. It was all built by one man for his factory workers. I want to ask you another question. I told you earlier, I have free education, free healthcare in England. Who paid for those things? You did. Every time you bought a British product, these things, the profits went back to my country and paid for me to go to school. So thank you for my education. I'm sorry I squandered it, but I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> Please tell your parents. But that just illustrates how important business is. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. The role that business has in building up our country. Our country. Um, you know, the way that business is done is very fundamental to what kind of country we live in. If, uh, if I were a business owner, and I live in Forbes Park, or in Corinthian, but my workers live in Chanties, I would have built a third world country in my bit of the Philippines. I could not be rich as a business owner if my workers are poor, because I would have failed the Philippines and failed Filipinos and built a first world lifestyle for myself, but not for them. The way that business is done is very important. It has more power than government because business employs more people and business has more money than government. All businesses put together. The way that we do business is important. Secondly, the career that you choose is very important. If you don't have your own business, the career that you choose will help shape this country. I feel it's a bit of a tragedy that very often the two highest aspirations of our top students are either leave the country or work for a multinational. In both cases, you spend your whole life making another country rich. The multinationals want you. Other countries want you. They see the talent in you. They see that Filipinos are hardworking. They see your creativity, your dynamism. Can you imagine if all of the talent of the Philippines were put into making this country prosperous? What a beautiful Philippines we could create. So the way business is done is important. The career you choose has a big consequence for our country. And thirdly, the things you buy also has a big impact. I just came back from Thailand. I was in um, the world, I attended together with my wife the World Economic Forum a couple of weeks ago in Thailand. And uh, we met the Deputy Prime Minister, who is the Minister of Finance in Thailand. And he was saying in Thailand there is a law where if you go into the supermarket, 20% of all the space in the supermarket must be given to Thai products. And they enacted this law because before that, the multinational products, all the imported products, were killing their local companies. They were buying up all the space in the supermarkets, buying up all the advertising on TV, and all their local industries were starting to die. And when they enacted this law, just 20% of the space must be for Thai products. It regenerated so much of their local economy, so much of their local industry, and they're now prospering. Two years ago, I was supposed to buy a new car, and uh, I was looking at a Mitsubishi and a Toyota. And I really liked the Mitsubishi. It was more powerful, it had more features, and then a friend of mine told me, oh, did you know that Mitsubishi is assembled in Thailand, but 
the Toyota is assembled here in the Philippines. You know what I did? Can you guess? I bought the Toyota. I bought the Toyota and I love it and I made the right choice because love of country cannot be just singing the national anthem. We all sing, many of us, the national anthem on Monday morning before we begin work or school or, or service. And yet 10 minutes later we import all of our ingredients from China, making China rich. So love of country cannot only be in the national anthem. It has to be in our mouths, has to be in our hearts, and it has to be in our pockets. And you can change this country by deciding which company you work for, what products you buy, and how you will build your business if you're lucky enough to own your own business. And so that's why three years ago, my wife, Anna, came up with the idea of starting a company called Human Nature. And we call this a patriotic social enterprise. What is that? What is social enterprise? Well, let's have a look. We all know what capitalism is. Maximize profit. You buy at the lowest price, you sell at the highest price, and if you make enough profit, you give something to charity. That's capitalism, right? But it's a bit of a game of war. You're always trying to, you're at war with your customers, you're trying to get them to pay more. You're at war with your suppliers, you're trying to give them less, so that you will have more profit. So what is social enterprise? It's similar, it's still a business, it has to be profitable, it has to be sustainable. But it starts by making certain decisions about what it stands for. It has to be profit for a cause, doing some good, and it has to be profit with a conscience. So not only uh, maximizing profit, but making sure it's done in a good way, not damaging the environment, not providing products that are bad for people. So we started this patriotic social enterprise, and we founded it on three things. Pro-Philippines, all of our ingredients, by the way, we make a natural and organic personal care products and cosmetics. All the ingredients must be able to be grown in the Philippines. We will not use any ingredient if it cannot be grown here, because our vision is, in the end, every single item we buy will come from the Philippines. And even the packaging, we only buy local packaging, even if it's cheaper in China, even if it's cheaper in Taiwan, we buy products which are only made in the Philippines, because this is our home, and it needs our help. Pro-Philippines, number one. Pro-poor, number two that we work with farmers and garden killing villages, we train them, we give them equipment, and then we buy their produce. And pro-environment, we don't use anything that's harmful to the environment. When you start a business, there are many times that you will come up with a decision point. It's easier to get something out of customs if you bribe somebody, unfortunately. But if you make a decision on the day that you begin, that you will never do that, you will never be faced with that decision. Because as soon as it comes up, you already made the decision when you started. You know you can't do it. There will be a time when you're faced with a, a, an ingredient that might be cheaper to use, but maybe it's harmful. You know that you can't do it because you made the decision at the beginning not to. So we started the business on these principles. This is uh, one of the communities we built in Bicol. Uh, this is Citronella. Um, they can earn three to four times from Citronella what they could from rice when they do it properly. This is uh, in Davao, this is a Gawakilina village where we're growing sunflower. There is no sunflower industry in the Philippines yet. Uh, there used to be, but the price that the farmers could sell it for was so low it all collapsed. And so we're the first one that's starting sunflower again in the Philippines, and this is in Davao. And so I'm hoping by the end of this year we'll actually be able to use their produce. We're testing lots of different seeds. And so this is what being pro-Philippines means, that we don't just look at them as a supplier, we have to help them be world class. And our farmers can do it. You know, if you go to central France, you will see kilometer after kilometer of sunflower there. If a French farmer can live a first world lifestyle, why not a Filipino farmer from growing sunflower as well? And it's not only about giving it away. This is our flagship store on Commonwealth Avenue. We're only three years old, but we have 23 branches. Uh, we sold more than three million products last year. Loving the country works. Doing things the right way works. Treating people well works. And that gets me onto our next philosophy, which is faith in the Filipino. This is what everything in our company is built on, faith in the Filipino. First of all, we employ residents from GK villages, people that the rest of the world say are no good. The cornerstone that was rejected, they've become the cornerstone of our business. They didn't go to school. Some of them can't read or write. 
They didn't finish high school like me. But if I can do it, why not a Filipino? And so we employ them. And we pay them a minimum of 625 instead of the 400 that's, uh, that the law saves, because that's really not enough. Why do we do that? It means that we have to find other efficiencies in our business. We have to be more creative, because we're trying to pay our people more than other businesses do. And that makes us better at what we do. We have no choice but to be better at it. Uh, we also pay them for five days a week, but they only have to work four and a half days a week. The other one day, we give them back to their communities so they can serve. We have something that I've never heard of before, a no-firing policy. Every business person that you speak to, if you tell anybody about this, they will tell you this is crazy. That no business should have this. People will abuse it. People will stop working. We have about 130 people in our head office, and there is one person who I am a bit suspicious might be abusing this policy. And maybe he's not working quite as hard as she should. You know, I have something to tell you. A bad leader blames his followers. If ever you have your own business, or, or you're just a manager or supervisor, if you have somebody under you who's not doing a good job, you blame yourself. People want to do a good job. The reasons for not doing it are either that they're not motivated, in which case it's your fault as the boss, or that they're not trained, in which case it's your fault as the boss, or that they don't have the skills, they're in the wrong job, in which case it's your fault as the boss for hiring them. Find them a better job to do. So no firing policy, and I found that this really works for us. But we don't baby them. They know they have to work. And as a result, our warehouse, all our people are laughing in the front. How many of you are babied? <laughs> as a result, the, our warehouse is better, more efficient, makes fewer mistakes than my warehouse before in the UK. Filipinos are world class. And so I just want to share with you before I end a few other uh, businesses that are also social enterprises. I'm hoping some of you will come out of this inspired to start your own social enterprise. That before you decide to leave the country or before you decide to work for a multinational, that you will give yourself two or three years to start your own business and see if you can make it fly. Here are some of them. Uh, Tresse Printers. This was started by a group of Ateneo graduates who worked with Gawad Kalinga uh, in Payatas. It's just a simple printing business. But they make old patriotic designs um, and, uh, you know, they told us that if we just paid, you can see a human nature bag there in the top right hand corner, if we paid two pesos more for that bag, that the salary of their printers would go up from 200 to 500 pesos a day per person. We sell that bag for 150 pesos. So what's two pesos? So that somebody can have a decent quality of life. Can you imagine? Look at this. This looks like it came from Milan or Paris. A Sinton Lirio. This is just made from water hyacinth. It's a weed in the Pasig River and other rivers. Does this look like a weed? Look how beautiful this is. How innovative. And in fact, can you stand? I just want to show <laughs> She didn't know I was going to do this. I just, want to, I just want you please to stand, Noreen, so that they can see you. The family of the Sinton Lirio. Amazing. These people inspire me. This is going to be the next day of the future. I want to ask you a question. Which countries around the world are known for producing the best chocolate in the world? Switzerland. How many cocoa beans grow in Switzerland? None. Not a single one. They buy the cocoa from the Philippines, they turn it into chocolate, they sell it back to us again for 20 times the price. Debat? We can do that. We can turn it into chocolate. And that's what Theo and Philo are doing. This is the very first chocolate in the Philippines that is 100% Filipino. From the bean, to the bar, to the packaging, everything. This is the Nestle of the future. Another one that I'm very proud of. This is Chilka. Chilka was formerly a lawyer, a public defender, and became a social entrepreneur. She was a Gawad Kalinga volunteer, and she discovered that there is a GK site in Sulu that grows coffee. How many of you have been to Sulu? How many of you have got one? How many of you are going there for your holiday next year? <laughs> Nobody. Of course not. Everyone is petrified of going to salute. You're the most courageous person in this audience. Well done. Everyone is petrified of salute. Chilka, when she found out that they grow coffee there, she wanted to change how we think about salute. She calls this coffee brewing peace in the South. Only for the brave. 
ruin peace in the South. She wants to change how even people in Sulu look at themselves, but especially how we look at them. Why do we need to buy coffee from Colombia? Why do we need to buy coffee from uh, Brazil? We have the coffee here. We just needed somebody to put it in a package and give it to us. Hopefully this will be the Nescafe and the Starbucks of the future. 10 years, 20 years, I hope this is bigger than Starbucks in the Philippines at least. Diba? Do you agree? Yes. You are world class. Filipino products can be world class. Made in the Philippines should mean world class. Just as good as made in the USA. Just as good as made in Italy. We have the raw materials. We have the Filipino dream. And this can be our future. The future for our children. I just want to end by, in a nutshell, telling you that the key to progress is very simple. It's love for country. That's it. The start and the end point. If you love what God has blessed you with, He will give you more. God blesses nations when they learn to love the poor. And I've come to really, really believe in this country with all my heart. And the Filipino dream, I think, can be summed up like this. A saying that we have in Gawad Kilinga. Less for self, more for others, enough for all. Do you believe in that? I believe in that with all my heart. God bless you all. God bless the Philippines.